<laughs> All right, I'll get started. Um, the, the title for the presentation, uh, the, my presentation was formulated as a question, uh, namely whether life coding is, is inherently a speculative paradigm for creative expression. And, and that formulation of a question is really kind of programmatic for, for what I'm, I'm doing here because I'm not too sure about uh, the answer to the question that I posed. So primarily I'm interested in picking that apart a bit uh, along with a few other questions related, related to it. As I go about doing that, I'll introduce you to some aspects of the creative practice of live coding, both conceptually and, and also a little bit practically. I'd actually plan to do a demonstration, a little mini performance uh, as part of my presentation uh, on, on this little device here, but we had a problem hooking it up to the projector, so I'll show a video instead uh, that I'll we'll put on in a few minutes and that will kind of run throughout uh, my presentation. And that's okay, because um, just as I'm not too sure about the answer to the question I posed in the, in the title of my paper, I'm, I also wasn't too sure about whether my code in my demonstration would have worked out or, or crashed spectacularly. <laughs> so what I'm concerned here with is essentially the ways in which life coding um, as a creative practice is informed by or how it might in turn inform a number of ideas about speculation. Essentially, life coding can refer to really any real-time programming activity, but it's mostly associated with the improvised creation of electronic music. In purely technical terms, what live coding refers to is the real-time writing and manipulation of digital code to synthesize sound. But live coding artists don't make use of any of the tools that we have devised over the years to make it easier to create electronic music. No sequencers, no samplers, no software synthesizers that are triggered by USB keyboards. Live coding is literally the handwriting of code, usually in object-oriented, language-based coding environments. The coded instructions are declared and evaluated in real time and turned into sound seamlessly. The most obvious implication of this is that live coding is through and through a performative practice. It pretty much exists only in the moment of performance. A live coding CD doesn't, doesn't really make much sense. This has interesting implications also for how live coding fits into contemporary sound art contexts. The practice is clearly related to such contexts through shared traditions of improvisation. But because we are here also speaking about programming in a more traditional sense, the concept may uh, appear to be a bit of a contradiction in terms. We are all aware that programming, that the purposeful manipulation of, of code, is heavily structured, heavily rule-driven, uh, a heavily rule-driven um, writing practice. And it is generally assumed that this cannot really occur in real time, because we tend to think of programming as the creation of relatively fixed texts of code that become useful generally only after they are finished. Only once code is settled into a relatively fixed, complete form, we tend to think it can be evaluated and thus become useful. Um, partial snippets of code uh, don't usually work. Particularly, if it is to be connected to a specific function, code is usually something that we imagine as always already written. Now, live coding um, has, this, has an ambition to, to kind of unhinge that assumption. As an improvisational performance practice, none of its code, we might say, is ever already written. And it is in this sense that live coding appears as somewhat of a contradiction in terms, a logical impossibility that, you know, striving to, to be the opposite of the always, always already written code. The live coding community has a manifesto that I will invoke a few times, and the manifesto clarifies this ambition of opposing the always already written really well. One of the main instructions in the manifesto says that you should always write your code from scratch. Live coding is us all about making music with code that, as I said, is never already written. As such, the practice emphasizes openness, it emphasizes dynamism, and here I got to the core concern um, that I want to explore a bit, namely the question of whether this makes live coding an inherently speculative mode of expression. David Ockborn, who leads the Cybernetic Orchestra Live Coding Ensemble based uh, in Hamilton, recommends that members of the ensemble never save basic code snippets, but rather that they should always practice writing these code snippets new each time they wish to play them. Uh, in a very similar vein, Nick Collins, who is a performer, researcher, uh, and a programmer, and a, a key figure in the international live coding community, he talks of blank slate coding that always begins from an empty document every time. Uh, Thor Magnuson, another well-regarded research practitioner in, in the community, 
describes his own performance practice in very similar terms. Typically, he says, performers start with a clean sheet, a tabula rasa, and builds the composition from scratch. So as a performative practice, live coding pushes the artist and the audience into a somewhat uh, speculative dialogue on things that are yet unknown or maybe even unknowable about the performance. In the live coding manifesto, the combination of the performer's mind, the computer, and the program are referred to as the whole human instrument. And then the manifesto demands that audiences be given access to this whole human instrument. In what is perhaps the most important part of the manifesto, we're told how this can be achieved. Show us your screens, the manifesto requires. And, and that's really a, a hard, irrevocable rule by which um, most or all live coding artists live. They always project their screens during, per during performances. And this brings me back to the question that I raised a few minutes ago, the question that is also you know, the title of my presentation. What is it that live coding does in making its creative processes so transparent? Does it do away with speculation by showing its screens? Or does it perhaps, quite on the contrary, invite speculation by showing its screens? Or, on the contrary yet again, does it in fact maybe try to force speculation because it shows its screens? The commitment of virtually all live coding artists to share their screens uh, whenever they perform is usually one of the first things, one of the most prominent things that you will read in, a, in any description of the art form. Quite often, this is used to explain how live coding has emerged in opposition to the obscurantism of late 20th century electronic music, where in all kinds of pseudo life settings, we often have to look at performers who are basically um, hiding behind their laptop screens, making it impossible for us to know anything about what it is that what it was that they were doing. They might have been checking their email, might have been playing solitaire, who knows. To many, this was a pretty frustrating experience, uh, somewhat diametrically opposed to what we expect and desire when we watch a live performance. Bob Ostertag, himself a really accomplished performer of electronic music, has observed in an essay on this phenomenon uh, that, that carries the very fitting title, uh, Human Bodies, Computer Music, that when we witness the performance of electronic music, certain key affective components tend to be missing which can dull our experience, which can complicate our appreciation of, of that, that which we see performed. We could also describe the lack that Ostertag points to as a foreclosure of the possibility of speculative appreciation on the part of the audience. Life coding, it might seem, emerged in recognition of this problem and as a direct reaction to it. I'm gonna start this video now, which is a documentation of a life <coughs> coding performance, uh, not my own, uh, Andrew Sorensen, uh, uh, performing a piece in uh, a language called uh, impromptu. So what might this uh, newly emerging constellation of audience improvising performer real-time code and shared screen mean? Are live coding practices and live coding performances pointing toward the recuperation of a form of distributed speculative agency that was foreclosed by previous practices of electronic music? In a variety of ways, this might certainly seem to be the case. In fact, the second sentence in the Life Coding Manifesto reads, obscurantism is dangerous. It is certainly in order to embrace this dictum that Life Coding both vows always to show its screens and chooses to strip away all ornament of graphical user interface and the like. To handwrite your code, to handwrite your sound generating code in real time, is to remove any intermediaries between yourself and the coded instructions. It is to try and enact a return to some kind of ur form of human-computer interaction, the simple command line, the input-output terminal. Or perhaps it would be better to say that live coding artists practice a, a kind of self-reflexive media archaeology, engaging in experience, experiments with the materiality of code in ways from which software tools for making music had previously cut us off. What can we do, the practice seems to ask, after we have developed the most advanced graphical user interfaces that allow the most complex operations to be conducted invisibly? What is lost in the process of making computational processes invisible? Have we, in developing these tools, actually produced a situation that, once again, forecloses speculation? If so, then what happens when we strip away all these interfaces designed to simplify our interactions with code? This is not to suggest, of course, that um, we have to keep computational tools used for creative expression so simple that we might be able to always follow their abstractions in our little monkey brains. 
But we have constructed many interfaces and software environments for creative practices that have a built-in quality of obfuscating our ability for productive, creative, political, utopian speculation expressed in code. This obfuscation occurs when our coding drives are forced into pre-established formulaic roots of expression. Or maybe I'm looking at this from the wrong angle. On the one hand, it's undeniably justified to describe any graphical user interface as an attempt to assist our expressive capabilities by streamlining and simplifying the required inputs. But, and I think that's a key, uh, a key but, um, these simplifications also function to complicate the speculative, exploratory, improvisational desires that might inform our creative practices. Artists have often, have always really found ways to overcome these obstructions and traditions of improvisation as a whole could be characterized in this context. A good example might also be the practice of asymic writing, a kind of wordless text-based poetry that opens and explodes the semantic registers in which we are usually bound, producing words that have no singularly specific content and which are therefore very open to speculation and interpretation. But I wonder if this is a useful analogy for thinking about life coding. I would argue that any graphical user interface can be read as a manifestation of some sort of ideological apparatus. Or as Alex Galloway has written, that the syntax underlying any programming language can itself be read to manifest an ideology. And if this is the case, then the guidance we accept from a graphical user interface might be considered to be hugely problematic. And the return to the command line may be considered empowering in the extreme. Sure, the graphical user interface is a simple gateway towards the incredibly complex or operations that we can trigger deep in the bowels of whatever software we use, but this simplified interface also affects a censoring. It channels our expressive coding drive and like, li likewise, I would argue, the speculative desires of audiences who witness live performances, always already translating them into standard procedures that won't throw any errors. I wonder then if the return to the handwritten from scratch that live coders practice is a kind of perverse act of self-liberation that simultaneously makes their lives very, very difficult by removing all the aids and simplifications that we have previously designed for our interactions with code. So I repeat my question, is live coding a form of asymic writing? Likely it isn't. If anything, a return to the command line does not represent transcendence of semantics and syntax, but rather it foregrounds and emphasizes the importance of syntax, the importance of adhering to the rules underlying any programming language. The smallest mistake in a live coding performance and everything stops. Or perhaps, on the contrary, everybody's eardrums will blow out. Put differently, live coding is a lot more difficult than generating electronic music with most of the software tools that mask and simplify the computational operations underlying our music making. To code live by hand requires high-level high knowledge of programming languages and sound theory, so even though the art form strives to distribute creative and speculative agency among collaborative performers and their audiences, we might at the same time charge it with exclusive or elitist tendencies. Somewhat absurdly, it is, one of, it is at one and the same time both highly accessible and inaccessible in the extreme, deliberately difficult. And yet, audiences at live coding performances tend to always understand instinctively that the artist's commitment to sharing their screens is designed as a move towards accessibility, not one away from it. In this double bind of illegible access. Live coding marks, I would think, uh, an interesting shift towards a new kind of facilitation of speculation, both on behalf of the artists and on behalf of their audiences. In previous incarnations of electronic music performed live, in which performers may have been hiding behind their screens, audience may have been forced to speculate about what might be going on because it was impossible to actually experience what the performers were doing. Here now we have a different situation. Audiences cannot help but witness every single variable change, every polypsestic alteration, every correction of syntax, every declaration and redeclaration of every line of code. I imagine this is designed as an attempt to somewhat demystify rather than obscure processes of data generation, data manipulation, and data flow. But of course, you might ask if that actually works. You have watched a ton of code unfurl now on the screen here, 
while I've been talking. And regardless of your level of code literacy, my guess is that you will agree that it is somewhat perplexing and confusing. <laughs> that which we cannot help but see, all the code, is, despite its visibility, very confusing, and more likely than not, quite illegible to most of us. But maybe that's exactly the point. Embedded in this somewhat twisted attempt to demystify a very <coughs> difficult creative process is a desire to invite speculation about this very process. In this sense, speculation is a key component of live coding practices, and it weaves its way into the structure of compositions as well as into the format of performances. Sure, audiences watching the code undulate on the screen can speculate what it might do, but being a performer myself, I can tell you that part of what's going on is also always that I will speculate what the software is about to do next, um, because there's no margin of error, uh, no room for debugging in a live performance. And finally, most live coding compositions are also de deliberately structured in ways that allow the software and its powers of pseudo-autonomy and pseudo-randomization to speculate to some, to some extent on what it is that I, as the artist, might want from it. Before um, I finish, let me offer a final example of how elements of unknowability and speculation are incorporated in live coding practices. A quite popular performance type in the community is something that is called Mexican Roulette. It is essentially a live coding version of Russian Roulette, and it ha derives its name uh, because, uh, from, from um, a group of Mexican musicians who popularized it and who adopted it as a very rigorous and very difficult rehearsal routine. What Mexican Roulette refers to is essentially this. One person goes to a computer terminal and enters one line of code, then evaluates it, and thus makes it heard, ideally as some kind of looping sound. And of course everybody sees this, sees the code on the screen. Now the next person walks up to the terminal and either manipulates the existing line of code or adds something. The soundscape will change, or maybe it won't change, or maybe it will stop working, the code will break. And then the next person continues, and then the next, and the next, and so on and so forth. And this can actually be opened up to allow members of the audience also to join in and take their turn. The pressure on each participant might be considerable, and you can imagine that pretty quickly this usually turns into a game of taunts in which performers try to impress each other, playfully challenge each other, um, by, by coming up with really difficult expressions. Speculation is clearly part and parcel of such a performance or such a rehearsal setup, and I've seen this practice employed really effectively in live performance contexts. Earlier I've said that in some ways software code may appear to be diametrically opposed to speculative reason because whenever it is executable or declarative, it will always inevitably and explicitly be directed towards action. But overall, I suggest that live coding seems to, be, uh, seems to me to be quite successful in recuperating a speculative moment in our use of code, in our interfacing with code. By sharing screens, by removing graphical user interfaces, and by projecting illegible code all over the walls of a performance space, live coders, I think, re-enable exactly the type of participative, effective, emphatic speculation that makes going to concerts and seeing live music so exciting. It might seem to some that live coding tries to do the opposite because it's actually so difficult. And so, back to the question with which I began and with which I will now end, namely, what it might, whether it might be precisely the illegibility of the code, its convoluted syntax, that opens up live coding, uh, much like ascemic writing, to speculation. Thanks.